All right, in this installment of taking a look at technical gear, clothing, and food, we're gonna take a look at mostly food and then some of the overnight camping gear that you might need to climb a 6,000 meter peak, primarily in Nepal. So this particular aspect, the food, um, most folks who are booking a trip on a 6,000 meter peak in Nepal aren't gonna need to bring much, if anything, for high camp food. Uh, that's all going to be provided by the expedition service because usually you're not using a high camp you're just using a base camp and then climbing to the summit so if, if you're climbing island peak paldor peak nyakonga peak mara peak uh, most of the very common 6,000 meter peaks which are also sometimes termed trekking peaks even though some of them might have technical climbing most of them can be climbed from a base camp to the summit and so all this food that i'm showing is not really necessary because your base camp cook is gonna prepare things for you. You won't need to bring things from home. But if you are on a more technical peak, maybe you're climbing Amada Blom, um, Kajarig, probably do with a base camp, maybe a high camp as well, but Amada Blom for sure, um, and some other technical peaks where you can't climb everything from a simple base camp, then you might need to bring a little bit of food for a high camp as well. So we'll take a look at the food first, and then we'll take a look at a little bit of the overnight gear after that. So. You'll notice when uh, we look at this gear, whoops, <laughs> or, or you'll notice when we look at this food, um, there is going to be a predominance of carbohydrates. And that is because at a high camp, which oftentimes is above 19,000 feet, you haven't had the opportunity to fully acclimate for that altitude. This could also be if you're climbing an 8,000 meter peak and you're moving well above the area at which you've had an opportunity to acclimate. So, you know, for a climb Mount Everest, for example, most people will be in and out of Everest Base Camp for at least two weeks, um, giving you an opportunity to acclimate. But at the higher camps, you know, Camp 4, for example, you might only be there one or maybe two nights. So you'll be lucky if you can keep much food down. And if you can, you're probably going to need to stay in the realm of carbohydrates because it's really hard to digest fats and protein at that altitude. Um, so uh, that's what you'll see here. So. We'll start kind of at the top and I'll work my way down. Um, at the top, I just have some snacks and desserts. Um, these are things you might eat while you're hanging out around camp. That mango sticky rice can be really good, but the coconut milk is pretty high fat. And so um, that might be a little bit more challenging to eat. So I might wait to eat that until I've been at the camp a little bit longer, maybe my last run, something like that up to the camp. But I've got things like gummy bears and black licorice, I mean, you might want le red licorice. I've got, you know, these rice snacks. Rice cakes are also really good. I like crackers. Um, I've got some vegetable chips. Pringles can be really nice because they're pretty well processed even though they do have a bit of fat in them. Um, Freeze-dried mangoes. You're basically just thinking about what are diverse foods in terms of their texture, like crunchy and chewy. Um, which is really nice because a lot of times the last thing you, that you ate, you might have been feeling sick at that time. So you might want to have a diversity of food. And you don't want very strong flavors. You know, nothing spicy, uh, nothing super sour. That can be really hard on your stomach and on your palate. And again, you'll see predominantly focused on carbs. And then moving down, we have dinner foods. We're trying to keep these pretty simple to prepare meaning it only requires the addition of hot water, hot boiling water. And over here we have, you know, pasta primavera, uh, pad thai. Um, the pad thai packets there, you have the option of adding different items like peanut butter and things. If I'm not feeling that well, I might just not add that much to it. I might just eat mostly noodles. And then I have some sweet potato mash. You can also just get instant potatoes are pretty good. Um, the pad thai here all you have to do is add hot water for let it sit for a couple minutes and then pour the water off and then add your mix same thing I can choose whether to add my oil and my spice mix or not you know I might not choose to add the spice even though I really like spice at low altitude I've got an even simpler noodle dish this is a taste of Thai just spring onion this over here on the right is a miso soup and then if I'm feeling up for it I can add some chicken packets but the thing to note is I'm not bringing food that necessitates it, that in order to eat any part of it, I have to eat a lot of fat or a lot of protein. I have the option of kind of picking around the chicken and the pad thai or adding chicken here um, or just eating plain mashed potatoes 
uh, things like that. Sometimes I'll also just eat a breakfast for dinner, like simple muesli or cream of wheat or grits, something like that. That's, that's plain and easy on my gut if I'm not acclimated that well yet to that given altitude. And then for lunches here, you'll see I've tried to do a combination of sweet and savory carbs. Um, but again, you'll see it's going to be mostly carbohydrates. You know, once I'm acclimated, then I'll start eating more fats for sure. But uh, in here we've got, you know, honey, honey stinger energy chews. We've got some green tea, tea extract chews. I've got some stinger bars, some wafer bars and things like that. Uh, I've got plain bagels in here. Um, I have uh, pretzels with crackers. Um, in there and there is some beef jerky in, in a po packet at the bottom there and then some some almond butter um, if I'm feeling up to it but again I you know these are not the lightest weight meals and they're relatively bulky but I'm just trying to ensure that I have some sort of calorie that is digestible to me especially if I've had a gastrointestinal sickness or if altitude has affected my gut I'm not gonna want to put anything into my body that I've recently tasted so having a diversity of foods helps me <laughs> stay uh, stay neutrified up there, which can be can be challenging. And then we're gonna move down to breakfasts. And you know, I've, I've done things pretty simple. I find granola and muesli treat me pretty well at altitude. Um, and I have some granola that's sort of the pre-prepared cooked granola that's usually cooked in, in canola oil. So that's gonna have a bit of fat in it. Um, but I also have some plain muesli right here and they've labeled the bag um, so that doesn't have any oil in it at all um, so if my gut's not feeling that great this does have a, a bit of fiber in it however and it requires a fair amount of chewing um, and that can be arduous at altitude when you're worn out and it's cold outside you might not be able to fit, feel your lips very well so um, there's also cream of wheat here you'll notice that there's already been non-fat powdered milk added I'm a big fan of having a lot of fat at lower altitude, and I'll add things like coconut powder, powder or nido, which is powdered whole fat milk. But here it's all non-fat, and then I have um, powdered sugar, or in this case, um, I've got brown sugar that I can add. And I'll add that not only to my meals, but also to all my drinks, uh, like my tea. I'm going to load up with sugar. And then I also have extra powdered milk I can add. That's a way of getting protein into me and being able to drink it which I find is a much more manageable way to get calories in if I'm not well acclimated. And then I, along with that, speaking of drinking, I drink a lot of my calories. So I've got honey ginger tea here. I've got um, you know Gatorade packets, hot chocolate, a bunch of different styles of tea, sweet and spicy teas and um, black tea. Um, a lot of times the honey ginger tea and things like that that are pretty spicy, that might be a little bit hard to palate for the first day so I might save that for the next day moving up high or something like that and have just simple uh, black tea with some sugar and maybe a little bit of milk if I'm feeling up to it otherwise just sugary black tea seems pretty good some spare bags for repacking and then this year I'm trying this out and see how this goes um, but uh, scratch labs makes this super fuel mix which is a combination of simple and complex carbohydrates and um, they advertise that it's not particularly salty which is really helpful at altitude because salt is a blood thickener and your blood already is quite thick at altitude that's one of the ways that your body prepares <laughs> for altitude as you increase you know pee, you, you pee off a lot of your liquids um, and uh, so you know you don't necessarily want to thicken your blood any more than it already is so it's not hugely electrolyte or huge too much of an electrolyte drink and um, it also you notice it has 400 calories per serving and it's not a really strong flavor so all those things led me to try to this out this year um, i can't speak to its effectiveness for climbing at altitude yet so we're going to find out and just to be clear you know i do a lot of long distance running and i try to train my body to burn fat as fuel but what I'm burning is my body fat as fuel. I'm not burning you know, fat in my stomach as fuel. So even if I've trained well, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm gonna go out and you know, drink olive oil at altitude, or I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna drink or eat you know, fatty lamb up high or something like that. Once I'm acclimated, I can do that. But uh, 
I'm burning my body fat, not using my digestive system as part of that process. I've got a silicone bowl here with a long spoon, and then we'll get into some of the camping gear. Um, this I didn't talk about previously, so comms on the mountain. It's a few different options. You know, radios are really nice uh, within your party, and they tend to work reasonably well up and down a mountain as well, uh, especially if you have line of sight, but not always. Garmin inReach devices can be pretty sweet. Um, they, that's a satellite texting device. The drawback is some insurance companies, in order to get, say, a helicopter evacuation, they want you to call them and confirm that the mode of transportation that you are using is okay by the insurance company. So a helicopter insurance or a helicopter transportation service, for example. And so uh, it can be complex to com communicate by inReach device for some of those insurance companies. You could go with a plan like Global Rescue, which has value added um, rescue insurance uh, or rescue uh, services on top of you know IMG's uh, standard um, insurance, travel insurance, and that might be a good way to go. And then oftentimes you can communicate by inReach to Global Rescue. Otherwise, you might need a sat phone. So this is a pretty affordable sat phone. It does not work in the Americas. Won't work in North America. Won't won't work in South America. And uh, there are some unique things to know about satellite phones and their their um, satellites, whether they're they're sort of stationary satellites or try to maintain position or whether they, they are you know, orbiting um, and changing position. But this is a Thraya XT Lite phone, and um, this one does work in Nepal, and several expedition agencies use this one in Nepal. Um, so I've used um, uh, Iridium's systems before, so we're gonna try this one out. It was recommended to me by a friend who runs expeditions in Nepal. Um, so I haven't used partic this particular phone before. I've used Global Star and uh, Iridium previously. And then uh, we've got, um, you know, just some random things to keep in mind. Toilet paper, you're going to need to bring that with you from, you know, the last lodge in a lot of the cases or from home. If you're not going to have time to pick some up in Kathmandu, uh, you are unlikely to find it at many of the lodges um, for use uh, in, the, in the restrooms. But you can oftentimes purchase it from shops along the route. Just depends on your route and where you're headed. I also have... Um, these compostable kitchen bags. This is one way that we're getting our waste off, off the mountain from high camps instead of leaving it in place. For those of you climbing peaks like Amada Blom around camp two, you'll see just these fecal towers. Uh, it's a really sad situation. So getting your waste off the mountain um, is an important and responsible thing to do, whatever system everyone has for getting that out. And then we also have, um, you know, go anywhere bags and some hand sanitizer there. Uh, and then uh, this is kind of my unique stove system. I'm sure other folks use this, but this seems to work remarkably well in cold conditions and at altitude, which is a reactor stove by MSR, which is, uh, a, you know, has huge BTUs, which basically means high heat output, and it's remarkably efficient. Um, and then uh, when it gets cold, however, you know, it takes, uh, um, isobutane fuel and that isobutane fuel no longer burns efficiently but if you bring this little cup this is GSI um, let's see here I've got the you can just see what it is. it's just a little GSI mug here and this bowl nests inside the other one but if you take that you get two bowls they're really lightweight and then you can take them apart and and uh, put your fuel canister inside and then you pour a little bit of warm water inside. It may have been warmed really inefficiently on the stove at first, but that effectively brings the fuel canister's temperature up and then suddenly it's, it's burning as efficiently as if it was a summer, summer day. And then uh, you can then continually swap that water out with um, warm water from the stove and that works really, really well. Uh, those fuel canisters can get frozen into the bowls if you're not paying attention, but I found with the round shape and slippery nature of the inside of the bowl, you can usually get them out pretty well. I've got a hydro pack bag here just for storing a little water, and those hydro packs can take hot water, which is nice. Still have to keep that from freezing. Some notes on sleeping bags. This is just a zero degree mountain hardware bag that I have in a Sea to Summit uh, waterproof compression sack. It's an 850 fill down bag. 
you know it's great to use a bag that's 800 fill or above and uh, for the most part I usually don't bring bags that are more than zero degrees for my high camps and the reason for that is even if the temperature is a lot lower I'm oftentimes bringing down pants a big expedition parka mitts maybe even booties things like that down booties and so putting all those things on and then getting in the bag allows me to use that bag at much lower temperatures than zero degrees Fahrenheit and so that seems to be sufficient I know many people who work and guide on 8,000 meter peaks also will use a similar system and then just get in the bag with their 8,000 meter suits on and saves you a bunch of weight. You might have another sleeping bag at base camp is pretty common as well. And so when you get back down to base camp, you might have a really comfy bag that you're using if you're on a bigger expedition peak and you know, maybe it's yak accessible or you you have significant porter support. So you bring in two sleeping bags. And then we've got a Neo Air Thermarest here. Um, this one is the, the X-Therm, which has a really high R value or good insulative property. I find that alone uh, is pretty good sleeping on top of. I also bring like a small piece of closed cell foam that's cut to the shape of the back panel of my backpack. And I'll use that as a sit pad, but also a backup in case my pad breaks. But of course I always bring a field repair kit too pretty important it can be tricky to get it warm enough the pad warm enough for the the field repair kit to work but you know in the middle of the day inside a tent it can actually get quite quite toasty even at altitude this is a pretty minimal tent I'm bringing out um, just because there's a lot of technical terrain to get up to high camp um, this is a MSR advanced pro 2 um, it does not have a vestibule I'm using that as a single person tent and I'll cook in the tent um, without the vestibule um, and uh, if I do cook inside the tent I just need to make sure it's really well vented because carbon monoxide poisoning is quite dangerous uh, there's been a lot of deaths from that and uh, I'll also need to vent it because the steam and water vapor can really wet out your goods inside your tent like your sleeping bag so you may even want to put your sleeping bag inside a stuff sack or a contractor bag or something like that just to make sure it doesn't get um, get water vapor all through it and freezing I am bringing some steaks. I don't always bring steaks. You know, a lot of times I'll bring, um, you know, like uh, small stuff sacks that I'll fill full of of uh, snow and berry. But in you know, especially in the Himalayas, some of the higher camps, the snow can be wind blown and really hard to dig in. And uh, these may not work. It depends. Sometimes I'll even anchor things with ice screws or pickets, but. Bringing these along gives me a, a few options for anchoring my tent. Using those as dead man, for example, can work. Um, I've got a couple splints. You know, one splint would be enough. I've got two just because I'm out with a group here. And then I just pulled some of the string out. I've replaced all the guy outs on the tent. I find most of the time the guy outs that come with tents are really not sufficient for the winds that you have in some of the remote high locations. And, uh, that is a quick overview of some of the overnight camping gear and food you might need for specific 6,000 meter peaks in Nepal.